So I'm going to talk about a work that I did with my supervisors, Paul Jenkins, Darius Pano, and Diwete at the universities of Oxford and Warwick. We are in a setting of latent feature models. So suppose you have a large collection of images, for example, or you have a large collection of texts. In all these settings, you may want to represent your data in terms of a small number of latent components that are responsible for the properties of the data that you observe. So for example, if you have some images, you may want to represent them in terms of the objects that you see. Or if you have a large collection of newspapers, you may want to represent them in terms of the topics. And the topics are responsible for the words that you observe. So in all these settings, latent feature models are a useful way to deal with complex data in a way that is more flexible than clustering models as you don't only assign your objects to a single class, but you assign your objects to a mixture of latent features. However, we like to take a Bayesian approach, and specifically we like to take a Bayesian non-parametric approach, as if you're interested in learning what are the underlying features of your data, it's not really reasonable to assume that you know how many features there are. You don't want to fix k, the number of features in advance. So we use a popular prior from the Bayesian parametric literature, the Injan buffer process, which allows you to learn the number of hidden features from the data automatically. However, Bayesian parametric models are very powerful, but often have very uh, simple assumptions, very unrealistic assumptions about your data. For example, the Injan buffer process assumes that all your data are exchangeable. So the order at which you acquire your data, your articles, for example, in a topic modeling setting, is not relevant. So this brings us to our motivating example. We looked at the uh, NIPS conference paper, papers published between 1987 and 2015. And clearly, we have 6,000 paper, papers almost. And clearly, these papers do have some dependency structure. It is not reasonable to assume that papers that are close in time behave as similarly as the ones that are published very far away. So we like to relax the exchangeability assumption in the Indian buffer process, and we like to have a more sensible model to have to capture these kind of time dependencies. And the way we achieve this is by borrowing a model from population genetics, the Poisson field model. The Poisson random field is particularly appealing. It has been used with uh, great popularity in population genetics. And it's very interesting for Bayesian non-parametric, for the Bayesian non-parametric community, as it leads to a number of desirable properties. So looking at these pictures here, suppose you have four feature location matrices where rows represent your data points and columns represent features. So you have four different features at different times. The entry is blue, what means that uh, the feature is active in the corresponding object. Now, the idea is to place a model over the way the feature popularity evolves over time. So for each one of these four features, we determine what is the stochastic process, which is governing the time evolution of their probabilities. So if you look, for example, at the green line, the green curve, the third feature, this is very unpopular at the beginning. So nobody possesses that feature, and then it becomes more and more popular. The way we put our prior over the evolution of our feature popularities is by means of this Poisson field model, which has a number of desirable properties. So first, and most importantly, it allows us to generalize the Injan buffer process from Bayesian on parametrics by having a time-dependent Injan buffer process such that marginally, at each time point, you recover the standard IBP. And furthermore, we have continuous sample paths. So the popularity of features evolve continuously over time. So we don't need to impose any time discretization. And finally, it allows us to model an infinite number of features which can potentially be born and die over time. For example, in a topic modeling setting, a topic might be discovered at some point or it might be forsaken by the community. So it is reasonable to have a way to inject new features, new topics into the model. 
So stepping back, let's give some background about what the Indian buffer process is. So suppose you want to have a prior distribution over this kind of object, this feature, feature matrix X, uh, Z, where entries are active, meaning that the object possesses the feature. The Indian buffer process is, uh, was developed by Griffiths and Garamani in 2011 and is a popular prior for this sort of matrices which are binary and have a potentially infinite number of columns. The generative process uses this analogy of the Indian buffet. So suppose you have customers entering a Indian buffet sequentially and the first customer picks a Poisson alpha number of dishes which are, is represented by the first row. And then at each time, the next customers pick dishes according to their popularity and then pick a new number of dishes given by a new Poisson random variable. If you use this process, it can be shown that the rows are actually exchangeable, even though it sounds like it's a sequential construction. But if you look at the probability of this object, it's actually ir um, invariant to permutations of the rows. The nice thing about this prior is that you don't need, you don't need to pre-specify how many columns you have. You can learn it from the data. So if you have new articles, clearly you may want to discover new topics. You don't want to bound it in advance. At the same time, if you look at the realization of the Indian buffer process, you only have a finite number of entries with, which are active. You don't want to explain a finite collection of data points with an infinite number of features. You just don't want to bound it a priori. Now, as the rows, as I just said, are exchangeable, the Finetti's theorem tells us that there must be some parameter B and some mixing measure over this parameter B, such that conditioning on which we have conditionally independent rows. So as we have this exchangeability structure, we also know that there must be some parameter and some mixing measure such that we have conditional independence. And it has been shown by Thibault and Jordan in 2007 that this is given by the beta process. Now, this is quite crucial as we will leverage the beta process construction to make the Indian buffet process time dependent. We will develop a time dependent beta process. The beta process is a completely random measure and any completely random measure is identified by its Levy measure, which is given by this formula here. How do you construct one of these objects, one of these feature location matrices, given the Levy measure and the beta process? You simply apply two steps. So first, you draw a set of weighted atoms according to this completely random measure. And then, conditioning on these atoms, you draw ZI, which are the rows of your matrix, according to a Bernoulli process. Maybe in a more clear way, if you look at this picture, we have that the surface corresponds to the Levy measure of the beta process. And suppose you want to draw an Indian buffer process. So the first step is you draw a set of points from a Poisson process with this rate measure. So you are given a set of weighted atoms, which are given by the red points and the black lines. Then you use these weighted atoms to draw each row of your matrix, just like in a Bernoulli process. So in other words, the beta process gives you an infinite collection of tossing, uh, tossing probabilities for coins. And then when you toss this infinite number of coins, you get this vector of zeros and ones. Now, how do we introduce time dependency into this model? As I was saying, we do borrow a model from population genetics, which is the Poisson random field. So how is this Poisson random field structured? Let's start from the basic building block, which is the right feature model. So suppose you only have one feature and you want to have some way to describe how its popularity is evolving over time. So, the right feature model assumes that you have a population of size G and, and assumes that I individuals in this population are mutant. The proportion of mutants will correspond to the probability of the feature being active. And suppose that these mutants evolve over time, generation after generation, by 
a random sampling process, uh, just a binomial sampling given by this formula here. And you also have mutations, meaning that a fixed number of mutants become no mutant and vice versa. Now, this leads a Markov chain, a discrete Markov chain that describes the evolution of a probability of a feature over time. If you imagine zooming out, so rescaling time as t equal to f divided by g, the, gener the population size, then if you take the limit as g goes to infinity, then this discrete process becomes a diffusion, which is given by this stochastic differential equation here. What is important about this equation is that dB denotes the standard Brownian motion, and you have two terms, mu and beta, which are the upwards and the downwards drift. So suppose you have a particle traveling between zero and one, which is the probability of a feature evolving over time, and suppose that this goes to zero. Then you have that this converges to mu over two, which pushes the particle away from zero. So you have a particle living between zero and one. Now, an interesting property of this particular stochastic differential equation is that this converges to a beta distribution. So if you look in the plot above, you have a right fissure diffusion with two parameters, and you have that the ergodic frequencies correspond to a beta with the same parameters. So this takes us a step closer to the beta process. Now, suppose you have not only one of these features evolving over time, but you have an infinite number of these features. So suppose that new features are injected as in a Poisson process, represented by the blue circles, circles here. And suppose that each one of these features starts evolving as an arrived feature diffusion over time. Now, this feature starts, start with probability one over G. But what happens when you take the limit as G goes to infinity? When G goes to infinity, new features are born with a probability that is really close to zero. But at the same time, the rate at which new features are born is given by a Poisson with, dependence, with a dependence on G, meaning that you have an infinite number of newborn features. It has been proved that you have a balance such that you have an infinite number of features, but infinitely many of them are, have probability which is very close to zero. And if you look at any time period T, if you cut any slice of this figure, the distribution over these particles follows a uh, mean intensity, which is alpha x to the minus one dx, which again starts to look like what is the mean intensity of a beta process. We have to slightly modify this model to make it more suitable for a feature location setting. It is nice that we have an infinite number of features, which is what we want, as we don't want to bound the features in advance. And it's nice that we can have a way to describe how they are evolving over time. At the same time, this model is not really directly ap applicable to a feature location setting, as the right feature diffusion with parameters zero and zero makes it possible for particles to be absorbed at the boundaries, zero and one, which is not really desirable. So we modify the Poisson field by introducing a downwards drift so that the, each particle evolves is in a right feature diffusion with parameters zero and beta. We prove that the new mean rate of this process is given by alpha x to the minus one, one minus x, beta minus one, which is exactly the distribution of the weights, the rate measure related to the weights of a two parameter beta process. In other words, we can use the Poisson random field, the modified Poisson random field, to have a time evolving beta process so that at each time we can use it to draw our feature probabilities and generate a feature location matrix, just like in the Indian buffer process. So putting all these pieces together, this brings us to our model, our overall model. So we have the feature probabilities which are evolving over time, xt1, xt2, xt3, and they follow a Markov structure and suppose that you use these feature probabilities, which is an infinite collection, to draw your feature location matrix Z at each time. So you use these probabilities to have 
allocations of objects to features. Then, using this feature allocation, you can sample your observations. So this is the general structure of the model. And again, at each time point, we have an Indian buffer process. So now the question is, how do you use this model in practice for inference? Despite it looking quite involved, the model is actually straightforward in the sense that you have a simple Markov structure. So you have feature probabilities x1, x2, and x3 evolving over time, and then we have feature location matrices which are conditionally independent given these feature probabilities. So the way we do inference, we use an MCMC approach, and we can sample the Zs, the feature location matrices, given the feature probabilities, just using Gibbs sampling. And then we reconstruct the trajectories using particle Gibbs, a particle filter. Know that Bayesian on parametric models involve an infinite number of features in this case, so it's not really always straightforward to do inference in a way that it's exact. But we are able to do this thanks to the slice sampling technique. So in other words, we draw a slice variable, which is a uniform between zero and the minimum probability of the active features. And then conditioning on the slice variables, variable, we can only draw a fine, we only have to draw a finite number of features with probability greater than the slice variable. So we have a way to make this inference exact, despite involving an infinite number of features. In a more simple way, you only observe a finite number of features, so you only care about what you see. So everything that is below the slice variable at all times has a very small probability of being active, so you will never observe that in the data. So you don't need to worry about that. Now, we have a prior model, but this does not really tell us how the data looks like, how the data is generated. We need to link the model to the data that we observe. And to do this, we need a likelihood. We first consider a linear Gaussian observation model. So suppose our data is OT at each time T, and suppose that the model generating the data looks like this. You take A, which is a matrix of features, and you multiply it by ZT, which is the feature location matrix. So this product tells you which features are active or inactive in the data. So it acts like a filter. And then you just add some Gaussian random noise. So a typical inference problem is reconstructing what A looks like. For example, in a topic modeling setting, A are the words representing each topic. So what the features look like. And then you want to know which objects ha have which features. So you want to reconstruct the Z matrix. We tried uh, doing some uh, very easy toy examples first to make sure our algorithm uh, gives sensible uh, inference. And we constructed the model as follows. So we constructed the data as follows. We produced at 40 different time points a set of feature location matrices, and you, we produced a set of images which were corrupted by a large amount of noise. So the goal was to infer what were the, feature, the true feature locations, and we also wanted to infer what were the probabilities of each of the three features that we used over time. So you can see how the particle filter is able to track quite well the true feature probabilities, which are which are represented by the continuous line. And also the feature location matrices are reconstructed pretty well. Now, if we look at what the features actually were, the features we used were these three images here, which were combined to generate the data that you observe. Just like in a picture in an image, you have a set of objects. Those objects are actually combined to give you the image, the image that you observe. So we can see that these features are also reconstructed pretty well, and we have a fast convergence. Now, moving on to the main application of this work, our goal was to develop a topic model in such a way that topics can evolve over time. So you can have some dependency structure and account for the fact that you may have timestamps available. 
why is this useful for a topic modeling setting? So clearly features correspond to topics in this case. And topics may be discovered at some point in time, maybe forsaken, and definitely evolve in their probability. So we apply the right feature IBP, which is our prior, to topic modeling. Again, it is nice to be able to have a potentially infinite number of topics, so we are non-parametric. And it's also nice to be able to model the time dependency in a continuous way, so you don't have to impose any ad hoc discretization. And finally, a more technical assumption which underlies many hierarchical usually process-based models is that the general probability of a topic is usually coupled with the proportion of words that topic explains. For example, if you have a rare topic, such as astronomy, existing models assume that the papers related to astronomy only have a few words related to that topic, which doesn't really make sense. These two quantities should be decoupled. You may have rare co topics that cover the entire document where they appear. Our model is able to decouple these two quantities. Giving a brief history of topic models and the model that we are building on. So we are mostly based, basing on the latent Dirichlet allocation model by Blay et al. 2003, which uses a mixture of topics for each document. This was extended to a non-parametric model to allow for an infinite number of topics in the hierarchical Dirichlet process by Tay et al. in 2006. And finally, Williamson et al. in 2010 managed to decouple the topic proportions and the topic probabilities so as to have more sensible predictions. We are able to build, to build on this model by making the Indian buffer process time dependent. So we directly extend the focus topic model by Williamson et al. to a time dependent scenario. Again, this is what the model looks like. We have topic probabilities x1, x2, x3 evolving over time, as in the Poisson field, and conditioning on these probabilities, we first draw the feature location matrix Z, which tells you which topics are active in each document. Then, given this feature location, we are able to draw the actual topic proportions and then explain each word from each one of these topics. So for each word, first you assign it to a given topic, and then conditioning to that topic, you draw the word from the dictionary, as topics are just collections of probabilities over words of a dictionary. A natural question would be, how does this model perform compared to a static version that does not account for time? So we compared a naive version of our model, which does not have any post field kind of dependency over features with our full model. Clearly, if you consider uh, four features evolving over time, the static model will only try to interpolate the feature trajectories with constants. How does this impact predictions? So suppose you want to predict how a feature document will look like, given knowledge that you have up to that time point. We compared our model, which is the dynamic one, the green box, box with the static version, with the true, the ground truth, and we also compared against a hierarchical beta process. As another way to have dependencies over time would be by using a hierarchical structure. So you have a base beta process, and conditioning on this base, you have beta processes at each time point. As you can see, we are uh, our model is mostly close to the ground truth and performs better in predicting held out data compared to existing model models. So incorporating time dependency is actually sensible and leads to better predictions. Finally, we looked at the NIPS, the full conference papers published at NIPS from 1987 to 2015 which accounts for almost 6,000 papers and a huge number of work tokens. So the idea is that if we are facing such a large collection of documents, 
we really don't want to bound the number of topics a priori. And also we may want to introduce some dependency as topics really went through a steady change over these years. If we compare our model with the static counterpart of a, or a hierarchical beta process, again, if you consider all papers published up to a certain date, and then you're trying to predict the words that you see in the next year, then again, you can see that the dynamic model is doing this much better than, than the other counterparts. Now, our model is not only doing better and giving predictions, but is also modeling explicitly the way the features are evolving over time. So this gives us a way to get some insight over the evolution of popular topics of machine learning over time. So here we plotted some six example topics from NIPS, and we plot the popularity for each year. What is interesting to see is that neural networks were the most popular approach at the beginning of NIPS. It was clearly uh, out dominating every other single topic. However, you can see that neural networks went, to, went through a steady decline, and by the late 90s, they were not as popular, which is a well-known fact in the literature. However, if you look at the green curve, we had the rise of a new topic, deep learning, which by the last year I ran this model on, it was the most popular topic in 2015. So deep learning is actually dominating NIPS papers. Now, what do these topics look like? You can just look at the most popular words within each topic and determine what is a sensible label to assign. So if you compare the six topics that we obtained, you can see that neural networks is mostly about neural network architectures or backpropagation, while deep learning is more about convolutional neural networks and having a deep structure and a large number of layers. You can see whether that papers about neural networks are not really about backpropagation and connectionist approaches anymore. They are more about the deep level the deep learning level. So to wrap this up, we have developed a time-dependent beta process, which allows us to have features evolving over time, an infinite number of them, so we don't have to bound their number in advance. And we have a simulation technique, which allows us to deal with this kind of complex structure by keeping the inference exact without any approximations. And finally, we have applied this model to a topic modeling scenario, which is able to tell us, gives us, give us insight in how topics evolved over time and without bounding the number of topics a priori. Now, this model is a prior, is a useful prior, which could be combined with any kind of data and likelihood models. We have a way to allocate objects to latent features, but clearly beyond uh, detecting this latent structure, you want to add a likelihood model to say how your data was generated. So for example, you could apply this model to, for example, detecting genome patterns over time, or for example, for the evolution of social networks, where your metrics represents connections between individuals. And finally, we could modify the Poisson field model to account for more subtle structures into the evolution of popularities over time. So we could have selection and recombination to have specific drifts for each topic over time, so that not all topics evolve with the same trends, with the same drifts. So there might be more flexibility in the way they evolve. This is a list of references if you're interested, and if you're also interested in checking out the paper which appeared in the Journal of Machine Learning Research. Thank you very much. <laughs>